have, in fact, uh, a, a bit of a choreography uh, challenge. We are starting off with our special board meeting, and that will give us an opportunity to uh, acknowledge some of the wonderful work that our students and staff have been doing over the last little while. So that's a real great opportunity for us. Then we'll move into the um, special standing committee for some uh, discussion and decision making on uh, um, area review accommodation. Uh, then we will move into the regular board meeting, which will allow us to continue with our work of the board uh, as we normally do on a month monthly basis. So welcome everyone. Uh, I uh, see all trustees in attendance except for uh, Trustee Mahollan. Um, and uh, we'll just note that um, for the uh, minutes. I'd ask you all to uh, stand if you could and join me in singing O Canada. O Canada, our home and native land, of the anthem with some harmonic uh, components to it. I uh, really appreciate all efforts involved. Uh, we are now going uh, to the Profiling Excellence, uh, which is a really uh, very special time for us each month to acknowledge the tremendous work um, and recognition that our students and staff have been receiving, not even in our own board, but perhaps uh, in our uh, direct community or the province, or in some cases nationally and internationally. So we have um, Superintendent Stefanian to please uh, let us know who we are recognizing tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that wonderful introduction to Profiling Excellence. This is the time each month that we do look forward to taking a few moments to step back and recognize the accomplishments of both our students and our staff inside our board, but also outside of our walls, uh, impacting departments, schools, and certainly the broader community, and this month is no exception. So I'd like to begin with the student recognition this evening, and I'd like to invite Norma Abdul from Ancaster High to please come forward. Nora, can you come forward, please? And she'll be receiving her Profiling Excellence Award this evening from Trustee John Stone. And we're recognizing Nora this evening for receiving a nomination for the Ancaster Mill Youth Volunteer of the Year. So a round of applause, please. wonderful before Profiling Excellence to have an opportunity to talk to the individuals that we're recognizing and to have them share a little with me about their interests and their passion. So it was very easy in meeting Nora to be able to see right away that she is motiva motivated by making a difference in the world. When I asked her to tell me a little bit about why she believes she was nominated for this award, she talked about the fact that she is involved in her community. I asked her to share with me a little of what that looks like and she talked about the recent gala that she hosted for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. She talked to me about the time that she spends volunteering at a retirement home. She talked with me about the time that she volunteers to teach children the Arabic language. 
She also volunteers at a pharmacy. Her mother continued to share with me other tutoring of students she was, has been involved in, and she turned to her mom and said, oh yeah, but that was a long time ago, and somehow I don't think it was that long ago. Certainly uh, very easy to see that Nora is making an impact in her community. She's in grade 12 at Ancaster High, and she is headed off to university next year. She's not completely sure which university, but she's leaning in the direction of Ottawa, and she will be in the Health Sciences Program. Building on the work that she has been doing impacting her local community, she's very interested in pursuing medical school and being involved in the Doctors Abroad Program. And we can certainly see that already she's managed to have that impact locally. So I always have to ask, why? Why do you do it? And she said, well, I just love helping. Uh, it's really important to me to make a difference. That it's a blessing to have all of the things that I have, and it's a blessing to be able to reach out and to help other people. So certainly, uh, we have seen firsthand the impact that Nora is making on her community and her school. And please join me in congratulating her on her Profiling Excellence Award. Next this evening, we have Felicia Benotto, but I don't believe Felicia was able to join us this evening. I'm doing a quick double check, so we'll just congratulate her in her absence. And next, I would like to invite another student from Ancaster High to come forward, and I'd like to invite Abby Sparling to come forward to receive her Profiling Excellence Award from Trustee John Stone. And she is here this evening because she received the Ancaster Mill Youth Volunteer of the Year Award and she was the winner. Again, an absolutely inspiring opportunity to have a conversation with a young person who is having a profound impact on both her school and her community. Also a student in grade 12, Abby has been involved in a number of school and community activities. When I asked her to talk a little bit about where she's been involved in um, uh, very humble, she didn't want to get into the list, so I had to pull some information out of her. But she did share with me that she's actively involved in the environmental club at Ancaster High. And in her connection to that work, it has fueled a passion for the environment, which has also had an impact on where it is that she would like to head after graduation. She's responsible for spearheading the work around the community garden that's happening at Ancaster High and the connections to that project and the school to the local community and the importance of growing local and eating local and all of those important connections. She's been actively involved in student council and is also a member of the rowing team. And for those of you who have worked with young people who are on rowing teams, you know that takes a daily, very early morning commitment uh, to be able to do that work. So we congratulate her for doing that. When I asked her to tell me what the future holds for her, she is headed off to university next year. She's going to be going to Trent. And no surprise here, her work at Ancaster has led her into the direction of environmental studies. And when we talked about what happens after environmental studies for Abby, she said, I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to be able to explore and better understand what options might be available for me, which um, is, is a perfect uh, lens to go into university with. So congratulations. And why, why Abby, do you do what you do? And that was a tough question. And she said, well, I love volunteering. I love meeting people. I love connecting with people. And the bottom line, it's about making a difference in the world around me. And the fact that each one of us with even small actions can make a difference. And certainly clear in having a conversation with Abby that those she works with, she inspires to do the same thing through her leadership. So again, please join me in congratulating Abby on her profiling excellence. <laughs> Thank you. 
We're now going to move to the um, 10 miles out, both staff, community, and student recognition. And I would love to be able to read you detailed information on all of the wonderful individuals that you see sitting up in the stands. And I'm hoping over the course of the next five minutes, I can do justice to this amazing initiative. Because it is a project that has involved staff, it has involved students, and it has involved community. And it is a project which really has had at the heart the mobilization of student voice and really providing students with an opportunity to share their voice through a creative medium. The 10 Miles Out project is a project that broke down several subject areas into an integrated initiative. So when we talk about the project, I think what you'll hear is it really was an opportunity for students to engage in a real life experience and to provide voice to that experience. And that project continues to have an impact beyond the walls of Glendale and certainly beyond the walls um, of those individuals who had the opportunity to view the production. So I will give you some specifics and, and we're going to be asking representatives from the student grouping, the community grouping, and the staff grouping to come forward to receive Profiling Excellence Awards on behalf of the whole group. And I also will be reading out the names of the individuals involved, so please when I read your name if you could stand for recognition. And I'd also like to ask at the very end if we could have um, the staff and the students and the community involved, if you could all gather outside for a group photo, that would be wonderful. So to tell you a little bit about uh, 10 Miles Out, in May of 2013, Glendale Secondary School presented their original, collectively written stage play, 10 Miles Out, The Legacy of Indian Residential Schools in Canada. The purpose was to raise awareness and understanding of the past histories of Aboriginals, Aboriginal peoples with a focus on the residential school system. For more than 100 years, over 150,000 First Nation, Métis and Inuit children in Canada were taken from their families and forced to attend one of the 132 residential schools between 1857 and 1996. We recognize the impact of the, of the schools caused great harm and continues to affect residential school survivors, their families, and communities today. The play 10 Miles Out is a result of the students, staff, and community working together to learn about and share their newfound knowledge about the history and reconciliation of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples with the greater school community. Students and staff of Glendale Secondary School work collaboratively with several others to build resources, listen to survivor stories, research historical documents, and visit key sites throughout Hamilton and the surrounding area. Since May, 10 Miles Out has received several awards, which is why they're here this evening, including the 2013 YWCA Peace Medal Award, and the 2013 Week of the Child Award. The Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair also acknowledged the initiative as being a great representation of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people coming together, a process of reconciliation. Over 2,500 students, staff, and community attended the performances where they had continued to respectfully pass on their learning to others. In order to give back to the Aboriginal community, the proceeds from all performances were donated to a local woman's shelter, the Native Women's Centre, with a portion going to support the school's arts program. So we'll begin by calling forward some students this evening. Actually, before we do that, just a round of applause for everyone involved. <laughs> On behalf of Glendale Secondary School students are Alice, Alice Robertson and Jeffrey Milligan. If they could come forward, please. And I don't think I see Alice, so Jeffrey's going to receive the certificates from Vice Chair White. The Glendale students 
18 playwrights and seven musicians spent time learning about the history of the residential school system as well as how to craft scripts and compose an impressive original music score written and performed by the students. In the final stage production, students use music, movement, and multimedia to depict the abuse thousands of children suffered under Canada's residential school system. And if you have the opportunity to see the play, you'll know that it was a play, uh, it was a production without words. And while the students had created the script and had practiced with the script, in the final days before the performance, part of the learning was what happens when the words aren't there and you don't have words to communicate your voice. And then the students had to look at how they were going to adjust and communicate in a medium without words. So congratulations, and I'm going to read out the names of the students, and for those who are here, if you could stand, please, so that we could recognize you and applaud. We have Clara Bistard, Charlotte McPherson, Johnny McElveen, Julia Paddock, Caitlin Powell, Wesley Riffo, Emma Robertson, Alice Robertson, Joseph Rossetti, Xavier Wood, Farhana Koya, Lucas LeBlanc, Cody Neely, Thomas Quintanella, Jason Smith, Daniel Weimhoff, Daniel Bell, Summer Arquin, Kennedy Taylor, Cassandra McDonald, Danielle Heatley, Anastasia Criticos, Mark Graves, Athena Mason, Matthew O'Connor, Ashley Reyes, Ellen Taylor, Brandon Francis, Jason McIntosh, and Loa Roxborough. Round of applause. of board and school staff is Dr. Jenny K. Dupuy, our Hamilton Wentworth District School Board Aboriginal Community Liaison. And I'd like to ask the teacher, Crystal Dimitru, one of the teachers, to come forward as well. The staff worked with Dr. Jenny K. Dupuy to learn about the histories through an inquiry-based approach where they were provided with culturally rich literature as well as connections to residential school survivors and the opportunity to visit the Woodland Cultural Center, Center and former Mohawk Institute in Brantford. More specifically, it was a chance for our HWDSB staff to learn together about the histories, starting with Crystal Dimitru, the production coordinator, Luke Bramer, the production director, Paul Borsch, the musical director, and other staff, including but not limited to Naomi Sherratt and Jerrica Ryan of Sir Winston Churchill, who led students to create exemplary pieces of art book that depicted the lived experiences of residential school survivors. And Crystal wasn't expecting to come down this evening because as any true leader, when we asked her who should come down and receive on behalf of the staff, she said, Jenny, which we very much appreciate Jenny being here. But I said, why isn't Crystal coming down? Well, because the true leader doesn't want to say, have me come down because she just works in the background. But we would be remiss if we didn't recognize Crystal for the um, incredible dedication and passion that went into the, uh, the production. Um, her visionary work, her willingness to think outside of the box, to put something in front of students and to hear student voice and to respond in that voice and to bring out the best in absolutely everyone she works with. And again, if you haven't had the opportunity to actually see the play, um, there is a clip that's available online. There's a documentary that's been done about the play. So please be sure to, to look at that. Um, Crystal, without your leadership, this wouldn't have happened. So we do need to say thank you. And I 
would also like to ask the other staff who are in attendance as I read out your names to please stand and be recognized. Paul Borsch, Luke Bramer, Sandra Crisante Crespo, Linda Wigton, Jennifer Haley, Barbara Dinesi, Debbie Avetesian, Naomi Sherratt, Carol Town, Amy Smith Summers, Jerrica Ryan, Jonas Skula, Margot Burnell Simba, and Karen Wilkins. And a round of applause for our wonderful staff. Thank you, Jenny and Crystal. Accepting on behalf of the community members is Shirlene Bomberry, the residential school survivor who was one of the individuals who worked with student staff and community members at the Woodland Cultural Center. Now, unfortunately, Shirlene is unable to attend this evening, but she has asked Danielle Heatley, a co-op student, to accept the award on the Woodland Cultural Center and Shirlene's behalf. So, Danielle. community members work together to not only acknowledge the history of the residential school system via their survivors and the Woodland Cultural Center, but also worked with a group of talented artists and engineers to create a 12-foot high tree that was symbolic of one of the trees that stood outside the former Mohawk residential school, a reminder of the past. The outcomes of the initiative were featured in a documentary, 10 Miles Out, a legacy project on residential schools, and we'll be sure that trustees receive a link to that in the trustee update this week. So, Danielle, thank you for accepting on behalf of the community, and I will read out the names of other individuals from the community who were involved, so please, if you're here this evening, please stand to be recognized. Jennifer Wilson Bridgman, Eric Quist and Quist Engineering, Madeline Levy, Andrew Beinhaus, Jennifer and Fr Francois Aubrey Weirland, Cheryl Red Eagle, Lori Gallant, Ivan Bomberry, Tara Froman, Shirlene Bomberry, and Geronimo Henry. A round of applause for our community. <laughs> we'd like to acknowledge the efforts that have continued across HWDSB to raise awareness about Aboriginal issues, the past, the present, and the future. As we move forward, we'd like to highlight that we as a board will be recognizing Aboriginal Heritage Week from June the 16th until June the 21st, and schools will be encouraged to continue their learning journey and to celebrate the success of our Aboriginal peoples today. And Madam Chair, that brings us to the end of Profiling Excellence. Thank you so very much, and what a joyous um, 40, 30 minutes that it has been to see such a matchup of students, staff, and community working towards something historically painful and an opportunity to heal through that together. I really ap applaud you all for the tremendous leadership you have shown all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, as I, one of the joys of being chair of the board is I get a chance to write my name at the bottom of certificates um, every week or so. And it was, uh, the students of course were new to me. So I was pleased to see names and to write my name at the bottom of the certificate. But I have to say from a staff perspective, I was not surprised by which members of the staff, in fact, were involved in this operation. I and was very pleased to put my signature to that and to so many well-known and very involved members of the community. I am just thrilled that this project occurred, that it still exists in formats that we can watch and, and enjoy, and I want to thank you all for your tremendous work. Thank you. I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. Um, as you know, we must then move into another meeting. Yes, uh, Trustee Simmons, a seconder.
Uh, Trustee Hicks, all those in favor? Thank you very much. We'll give a four and a half minute break and then we'll start up our standing committee. Thank you.
would like to call to order the special standing committee for Monday, May 26th. I'm going to ask trustees, are there any declarations of conflict of interest? The none. Thank you, trustees. We do not need approval of the agenda, seen as it's a special standing committee and items cannot be changed without unanimous consent as per the rules. So we go right to item number three, which is the West Flamborough Accommodation Review. And we do have all trustees present, including the student trustees. Uh, Trustee Petal is here, uh, but must have just stepped out of the room and she'll be back in a moment. Otherwise, we do have uh, everyone present. So welcome everyone to the meeting. So we'll dive right into item number three, the West Flamborough uh, Elementary Accommodation Review, and I will go to staff uh, on the report. Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to begin this report, I look to our officer to uh, come forward and uh, provide the overview. Uh, we will follow the same process as we have done previously, and I look to uh, Officer Delvianco to begin the process. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, in front of trustees tonight is the final report uh, with regards to the Flamborough Accommodation Review. Contained within the report is the recommendations uh, proposed by the ARC, as well as the recommendation proposed by staff. Um, we have followed board policy. Um, we presented the original report almost 60 days ago, and we are here uh, this evening to answer any questions and for trustee deliberation on the, the final decision. Thank you very much. So all the trustees have the report in front of them, which is item number three. Uh, before I look to trustees for discussion or a motion, I did overlook, uh, I wanted to welcome uh, Councillor Pasuda to the boardroom. Welcome back, Councillor. Thank you for coming and as well as uh, welcome to all of our community members, uh, media that are joining us today. So welcome and thank you for uh, coming to, to uh, tonight's meeting. So I would like to look to trustees now um, on discussion or motions on this item. Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to start with some thank yous, and then I actually have a handout with some revised uh, recommendations from what you have in front of you on 3-1. So we can start to hand those out, and in the meantime, I would like to start by thanking all of the ARC members from the five school communities. Dr. John Seaton, Beverly Central, Spencer Valley, Greensville, and Milgrove Public Schools. Uh, Superintendent Mag Gardner as the chair and skilled facilitator. Mr. Data, Bob Fex, and manager Ellen Worling from Accommodation and Planning. Kathy Ford, professional minute taker. The five school principals as invaluable resource persons. Their staff, and particularly the caretaking staff, who set up and put away all of the tables, chairs, and audio-visual equipment for each of the eight working group meetings and five public meetings. Thank you for your countless hours, your energy representing your school community, your ideas, your ideologies, and perspectives. You are a very professional and respectful group of individuals. This ARC has had a lot of political advocacy right from the beginning. Thank you to Ward 15 Councillor Judy Partridge and MPP Ted McMeekin for their attendance, support, emails, and perspectives. My special thanks goes to Ward 14 Councillor Robert Pasuda, as he has four of the five rural schools in his ward and many of the Melgrove families also live in Ward 14, but they go to school in Ward 15. Robert attended every meeting and every parking lot meeting thereafter. <laughs> Councillor Pasuda and I attended numerous extra meetings outside of the ARC with staffs and community groups in order to put forth the following recommendations to you. Our support today is to leave three rural community schools strategically placed across a very large geographical area. One in the Rockton community as a board city partnership on city owned lands. One in the Greensville community as a board city partnership on board owned land. And one in the Millgrove community status quo. So 
in your package this evening from page 3-1, you now have the pink paper in front of you. And these are the recommendations that I am putting forward with Councillor Pasuda and Councillor Partridge's support. I haven't had a chance to speak to uh, Mr. McMeekin, but I know that he would also support this. So I'm going to read the motion and then I'll be looking for a seconder. So that the Board of Trustees approves the following recommendation as set out below. From A, West Plamborough ARC recommendation part one, the revised, um, the revised portions are in bold from the original ARC recommendations. So the first one is, one, the closure of Beverly Central and Dr. Seton in June 2016. Secondly, build a new 350 pupil place, JK to eight school at the city owned Beverly Community Center upon partnership, partnership agreement with the city of Hamilton. In the absence of a partnership agreement with the city of Hamilton at the Beverly Community Center site, build a new 350 pupil place school on the existing board owned Beverly Central school site. Fourthly, proposed new school partnership is pending ministry funding. And fifth, proposed new school without a partnership is pending board funding. From B, West Flamborough ARC recommendation part two, again, the revised portions are in, in bold. The closure of Greensville and Spencer Valley in June 2016. Firstly, build a new 350 pupil place JK to eight school on the Greensville school site upon partnership agreement with the city of Hamilton. Secondly, Millgrove School remains status quo and open and remains as a feeder school for grades six to eight at the new school on the Greensville site. Thirdly, proposed new school partnership is pending ministry funding. Sorry. Fourthly, in the absence of a partnership Karen, agreement. Karen, can you repeat that line? I'm not sure if everyone heard that. I will. The third one, proposed new school partnership is pending ministry funding. Fourthly, in the absence of a partnership agreement with the City of Hamilton at the board-owned Greensville School site and Ministry New School funding, close the Greensville School and renovate Spencer Valley School to accommodate the consolid consolidated JK-8 to school. Millgrove School remains open, status quo JK-5, to and as a Spencer Valley theater school for 6-8. to eight. The capital requirements at Spencer Valley will be full day kindergarten rooms, classroom additions, music room upgrades, gymnasium upgrades, science and art room upgrades, as well as any other high urgent and capital needs to convert the middle school to a 21st century learning JK to eight school. Thank you, Trustee Turkstra. So Trustee Turkstra has moved what we see on the first page of the pink sheets. Do we have a seconder? Trustee Johnstone, thank you. Uh, Trustee Turkster, back to you. H would you like to present uh, these two these items in two parts, or do everything at once? Uh, I will. Um, I guess I would like to go with whatever the board would like. I, I, I think I'll be discussing part one because they the, the arc was essentially split into two recommendations for the east and the west part of this large geographical area. So I will speak. Part one, and then maybe trustees will have questions, okay. and then I'll speak to part two. Great. All right. So if you'd like to begin with part one, <laughs> microphone, please. Microphone. Thank you. So the reasons for recommended action part one is the Beverly Community Center site is a centrally located 60-acre full amenity site with an arena, baseball, soccer, football fields, etc for community use year round. The site is complementary for school use during the day and community use in the evenings and weekends. There is ample parking for school and community use. The Beverly Community Center site is seen as a viable partnership site by the city staff, the board staff, and conservation authority staff. 
Obviously, more studies have to be conducted, but in theory, this is an excellent board city partnership recommendation for the community. Since amalgamation and before, many rural schools have undergone closures and consolidations. This Western Review area is no stranger to closures with the latest consolidation in 2003. There have been no new rural schools for a very long time. Renovations were promised but not fully delivered. It is time for stability in our rural schools and schools as hubs are a natural fit as public services are less available and accessible. Excellent. Thank you very much. You did that in a minute, 20 seconds. Very good. So I am keeping time, but nonetheless, if we could stick to part one in response to the motion, I'll look to any discussion, comments, questions from trustees. I'll go to the seconder first, Trustee Johnstone. Accommodation reviews are one of the greatest challenges a community can undertake. And throughout this specific uh, re revision or review, there was a lot of thoughtful discussion that went into it. What I like about the motion is that it listens to the community. And as the trustee representing the other rural half of our board, I specifically like that we are listening to the concerns around the long commute for our Mill Grove students. I also like that it incorporates collaboration between the area trustee and the area councillors. I think that this is a great example of the city working together with the school board and I hope that there is only more collaboration between the city and the school board as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Johnstone. Next, uh, Trustee Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is a good example of um, what can happen uh, when we do have partnerships um, with the city, with the province, with others. The school boards can be left on their own. Uh, our hands are tied in many ways, so I hope, uh, I hope this uh, passes and we uh, move forward with other, uh, other uh, partnerships with the city in the future. I, I, I like this in many ways. I do have one question. Um, wondering uh, with this with this revise, with this motion, um, how many uh, people places are we uh, reducing? Thank you. Do we have that answer, Trustee Turkster or Officer Del Bianco? Three. Sorry. Three, Mr. Chair. This doesn't change the original staff or the ARC recommendation in that four schools would close um, and two brand new ones would be reconstructed. The two new schools would basically be designed and sized to accommodate all students in that area. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Trustee Simmons, thank yeah. you. Trustee. The, the other thing I like about it, sorry, Mr. Chair. The other thing I like about it is it uh, has fallback positions, so it's uh, robust enough um, that it will, it should be able to test, uh, stand the test of time as well. So uh, it will be supporting. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Hicks. Thank you, through the chair, I too, uh, commend the councillors of getting involved and attending all the meetings. It's amazing how things can be accomplished when both the city and the board work together to accomplish really what the community wants. And the input from the community here was outstanding. But I also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, Trustee Turkster. She has done a tremendous amount of work in going to the meetings. And it just shows how a trustee can facilitate the understanding and the culture between the board and the city. And when that is understood and that culture comes together, it's an amazing thing how things can be done and accomplished. So, but I have one question and that's the size of the school and I think I've asked this with the secondary size and so forth. Is Trustee Turkster and the officials in the community, are they satisfied with the 350 student new school and not larger. And I know that the ideal school, and we talk about 350, but you know my concern on that, that uh, we have built elementary schools and, and renovated elementary schools, and within a year to two years, we have portables on it. So my question through the chair to Daniel would be, is with the numbers and how it's all gonna pan out with the um, student spaces available uh, for the future, would, uh, is the board comfortable with 350? 
Thank you, through the chair. Thank you, officer. Through you, Mr. Chair, the board is comfortable with that number. Two points to make on this topic. One, we always build and will design new schools with an addition to accommodate more students should the population materialize later on. And second, prior to submitting any application to the Ministry of Education, we would review the projections at that particular date to ensure that we've captured the right amount of students, uh, both in the short and long term, based on development happening at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Brennan. Yes. Uh I will be supporting uh, this motion. Um, I think it's uh, a very uh, community-created uh, solution. Uh, I'm very pleased, uh, as I not only hear tonight, but I've seen uh, over the last number of weeks the uh, councillors' involvement and uh, leadership in working towards something that will work for the community. So I'm very, very encouraged. Um, uh, that, they, that that may bode well for other projects that we would like to talk to other councillors about. I had to say it. <laughs> Having said that, uh, I just, uh, just want to be um, clear uh, on the proposed new school partnership. It, because we're talking about uh, um, something that is probably going to either uh, be right beside Beverly Community Centre are we only talking about Ministry of Education funding or would there ever be any other funding that might come from another ministry because of the synergies between the different services at the two lo locations? Officer Delbianco. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I can only speak on behalf of the Ministry of Education and the portion of the project in which, <laughs> I can't speak on me, I'm sorry. I, I can, <laughs> that's where like this, no. Um, I can. <laughs> I can only speak on behalf of our application to the Ministry of Education for funding for our portion of the project. Yeah, and I, and I realize, Mr. Chair, I'm getting into some of the operational, how do we make this happen? Uh, at, at, at this level, in terms of, uh, of an idea and, and of a community focus, I'm extremely excited and strongly support the motion. Thank you very much. Trustee Poe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, uh, just ditto on everyone else's um, fine comments on this. I do have one question, though, to uh, the mover, uh, and I do believe the intent for parts four and five is that the proposed um, closure of Beverly Central and Dr. Seton and the new school being built is all contingent. To, it's all contingent together. In other words. We're not isolating item one to close two schools and then moving forward with the other points. So I'm looking to um, join these together somehow so they're not considered standalone and you actually have the authority for the closure of two schools and you don't get the rest. So I'm looking for a way that the language actually marries up all five points together so there's no misunderstandings that one is dependent on another, is dependent on another. And right now, it doesn't actually say that. Um, and so I'd ask the mover to think about that because I want to support that in its totality. I would not want to see two schools close and then we don't get funding, but they close anyway. And then they're consolidated anyway. So I'm going to put that forward to the mover. I'm sure that's not the intent. I'm sure that's not staff's intent, but because there's going to be, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, a belief that there will be such a turnaround in trustee members sitting on this board. I would like the language to be so tight it's not possible to change it. It's got to be married up somehow. Trustee yeah. Turkster? I think if we pass the motion in its entirety, it's a new school for this, it's a new school no matter what whether it's on the Beverly Community Centre site as a partnership or it's a new school on the Beverly Central School site. We are closing, if it passes, both of those schools and building a new 350-seat high school. Thank you, Trustee Petal. Okay, so to follow up, again, my, my worry is that it's rock solid, so shouldn't there be language that says that the the proposed closures of Beverly Central and Dr. Seton are subject to the new school being built. Somewhere it needs to say that. It needs to say it from my history and experience. 
Thank you. I'll go back to Trustee Terstra for clarification. Happy to approve any wording changes that would solidify that. Um, questions? Okay, I'll think on it. Trustee Petal, would you like me to come back to you? Uh, yeah, give me a moment. Thank you. Sure. We do have uh, at least two more speakers. Trustee Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to thank the committee and community members for the hard work that they have done on these proposals, which m modified ones, which have been uh, put on the table. Um, you, your schools and your communities came together to find common community agendas for your children. And we have watched with, with pleasure to see that um, you have come up with solutions that, that are going to enhance the opportunities for children in your communities. A new school, which you, as you've said to us, you want a new school in the Beverly Central community. Um, you want it at the community center and you want a new school and um, not, not a hand-me-down um, old school or some of those one room old schools that are scattered about the district. Um, the combination of two schools in Greensville and, and being centered at, um, on the Greensville site with a possible partnership Another possible partnership. Trustee Bishop, just if we could hold the second part. Um, this is comments oh, on the first I'm, part. I'm just saying, though, the whole thing it goes as one unit. All ties together for me. And, and I'd like to thank everyone involved in this. And I'd also like to thank you for reminding us about the realities of rural life, that you can't expect young children to travel for long distances, and for showing us the long transportation routes that already exist for middle school children traveling from Rockton and Strabane to, to um, um, Spencer Valley School. So I I'm, I'm, will be supporting these proposals and I thank you for all the work, for all the people who've been involved in doing this work. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Bishop. Uh, Trustee Glauser. Well, Trustee Bishop, you have stolen quite a few of my thank you words that have been going around the table. But having uh, just stepped in to uh, replace our good late friend Bob Barlow, all of this ARC stuff was fairly new to me, but I must commend the groups. You have been very, when the place was filled, you guys were still a very, very orderly group. Uh, a few things you might do on another time, but. Uh, one thing I would like to report is that I did take your suggestion to heart and I did go out and I visited uh, the Milgrove School and having been rural myself from Jerseyville, I know exactly what it is, retransportation and sometime I'll tell you how our kids had to, had to do all of their schooling which was probably worse busing and, and walking than, than the group. But uh, you did come together very nicely as a community and. Uh, uh, I do think that uh, Karen, as the trustee for that area, has done just a marvelous job for you in coordinating, as well as our staff. I think that uh, it really is a community and, and staff and trustees solution. So kudos to everybody. I will be supporting number one. Thank you, Trustee uh, Orban. Thank you. Comment is the cooperation of city fathers and uh, the MPP as well to recognize this rural community as a community that really cares about their children and to end the community itself. And that is what looking at trustees is all about children, community, and cooperation all of the taxpayers of this fair city of ours. And I thank you kindly, and I thank the uh, uh, trustee of the area, and I really thank also the uh, councillors, and thank you so much. So that's where I stand, and it's wonderful to see that kind of cooperation. Thank you. Trustee Mulholland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I won't be supporting it. I've talked to Tr Trustee Nurster 
The motion is fine. I do not. I do not support the closing of any small neighborhood schools. And the case has not been made to close those neighborhood schools. That's why it's okay for this one. But how about uh, Beverly Central and Seaton? How about uh, Graysville and, and the other school being closed? You know, they're losing their school in their neighborhood. So I'm not opposed to this type of This type of motion, I'm just in, uh, opposed to any uh, closure of any small neighborhood schools. Thank you. Before we go back to Trustee Petal, uh, first time speaker, student trustee Van Agnum. I'd just like to reiterate all uh, the words of the other trustees here. Just thank you to community members, staff, and students, as, uh, as well as parents who have given their time and come and uh, show us delegations and just speak up about their community schools. We have all gotten a sense of how much schools mean to parents and families, and it's really fantastic to see all the community members who came out. Um, just speaking from a student's perspective, the City par Partnership is such an amazing opportunity for the students of our board. Like, having the arena and all the other uh, resources that are there on the site is just fantastic for students and just furthering their learning. So that's about all I have to say, but it's just an awesome option. Thank you. <laughs> Student Trustee Susick. Lastly, but certainly not least, thank <laughs> I just jest. I apologize. Once again, thank you. I must thank everyone for vis visiting rather the schools prior to the decisions that were made or those who were able to. Coming from a student, knowing what it's like to be in a school and how adults may not exactly get the same vision of what it's like to be in a school. It really does help when you're able to step into those students' shoes and see what it's like to be there and what impact such decisions may have on them. In addition, I am confident moving forward knowing that students' needs are being identified and even more importantly, are being listened to. Thank you very much for that and for any ARCs uh, that come up moving forward, I hope this continues. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, and back to you, Trustee Petal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, my uh, friendly amendment that I'm putting forward is that we add uh, 0.6, and that it would read, the school closures outlined in number one above are subject to the new school referenced in point two being built. Okay, if you could repeat that one more time, please, Trustee Petal. Add a new point six, school closures outlined in small i in brackets, right? One above, are subject to the new school referenced in point two being built. Three, sorry, two and three. It is friendly amendment. <laughs> Okay, I don't think, um, I think we'll actually need a motion on that amendment. Okay, then um, it's a motion. Okay, so that's moved by Trustee Petal. Do we have a seconder for the amendment? Trustee Turkstra? Okay, so Trustee Petal, would you like to speak to the amendment right. first? So, so I'm, you know, the reason I'm putting this forward is tidying up is 10 years ago, we went through a lot of major closures on the East Mountain, four schools closed. And uh, I'm sure it wasn't intended but promises that were made and tours to a place to add port a pack didn't actually follow through. And this board of trustees and some of my colleagues are still here with me who were here at the time, had to make a board motion to um, ensure that promises made were kept and an actual port a pack built and toured and seen down in Winona at the time was actually attached. So I, I only bring it up as, a, as an assurance. I don't like to bring up the past history to be a negative, but I want you to understand why it's important to me that this motion be tight, 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 because some of us won't be here to do that kind of thing later to make sure our intentions were known. So we do it through our words, we do it through board motion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would you like to speak as a seconder, Trustee Turkstra? I'll support it if, <clears throat> if the language solidifies the rest of the motion for the trustee because I I think it was explanatory but she has the experience that things didn't happen before so I, I trust her judgment on that if she needs that to vote for it 
because it doesn't change the intent of the motion, then I'm fine with it. Thank you, Trustee Turks. For further discussion on the amendment only, Trustee Simmons. Just a question uh, for the chair. Uh, does the staff believe it changes the intent of the motion? Mr. Director. To you, Mr. Chair. To you, Mr. Chair. No, I don't believe it changes the intention of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Director. Further trustee questions? Oh, I'm sorry, trustee. Trustee Hicks. I need Okay, I, I will attempt to read it. I think I captured it, and correct me, Trustee Petal. But the school closures referenced in uh, I above are the new school um, will close when the new are rather are subject to the new schools reference being built. All right, close. I'll mess that up. Close. Would you like me to Petal. read it again? There it's right close. Uh, the, the school closures outlined. The word is outlined. The school closures outlined. In number one above are subject to the new school referenced in points two and three uh, being yeah. built. So it's outlined and referenced. Did you get that, Trustee Hicks? Between two or three being done. Two and three. Two and three. Two or three. Sorry, that got thrown as we were in process. So two or three, that's, uh, that's fine. That's a minor housekeeping issue. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, next on the list we have... Oh, I'm sorry, Tr Trustee Hicks, did you have something to follow up? I'm fine with it now. I just have to end. Thank you very much. Next on the speaker's list, Trustee Orban. This is not a motion. I heard from my colleagues, then I'll make it a motion. This is an amendment to the main motion. Therefore, we should be voting on the amended motion, not a new motion. So, so, so to, clarify, to clarify, Trustee Orban, this on the floor right now is the amendment to the main that is motion. What was said. So there was a mover, moved by Trustee Petal, seconded by Trustee Turkstra. So what is on the floor is the amendment, the discussion on the amendment. But she said, well, then I'll make it a motion. The, the, the amendment was made. There's already a motion on the floor, so a new motion cannot be introduced. It's no, an amendment. That's what it's the amended motion. That's correct. Thank you. Any further speakers before we vote? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is unanimous, thank you. Now we are back. Well, that completes what uh, Trustee Turkstra summarized as part one. Uh, before we. No, no, I'm sorry. So let me just clarify for trustees. We at this point, there's a motion on the floor. It has been amended. We've only discussed part one of the motion. You're now splitting them? No, we're not splitting them in terms of the vote, but Trustee Turkstra thought that it would be beneficial in order to explain them in two different sections, so that way trustees' questions would be directed to the appropriate section. Trustees wish to split them. That can happen. We can vote on part one now, or we can hold both parts until Trustee Pe uh, Turkstra <laughs> completes part two. I'm seeing nods to complete part two. So back to you, Trustee Turkstra, uh, for part two. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the reasons for the recommendation that are outlined on the pink sheet for part two. The first one is that Councillor Pasuda and I have recently explored the opportunity to partner with the city at the board-owned Greensville School site for the relocation of the public library, which is currently leased and not strategically located in the Greensville community for maximal community usage. This inquire, inquiry has been positively received by city staff, the CEO of the uh, Hamilton Public Library, and worthy of further investigation. In their words, a very exciting option worth exploring. We have also considered the community use of the new school as a viable replacement of the current town hall events. It is, in a, it is in a current state of disrepair with parking for less than 10 or 12 cars for community events. This inquiry has also been positively received by city staff 
and worthy of further investigation. In their words, a very exciting opportunity to explore. Thirdly, the counselor and I have talked at length about the Greensville school site being the most strategically placed location for the shared use of the parking lot for overflow evening and weekend parking of the guests of Two's Falls, Webster's Falls, and the new Johnson Two Arboretum and Community Park. As you will recall, this new 37-acre park is located directly behind Greensville School and is Hamilton's first city-owned arboretum. Solar-powered paid parking units could generate extra revenue for the school board to support student achievement. The arboretum and conservation lands are invaluable to students in terms of outdoor education, science and community heritage curriculum enhancement, and physical education opportunities not available at the landlocked Spencer Valley site. This will be there will be a small amphitheater and terraced seating for educational purposes, as well as an embankment slide. Let's not move our students and staff away from this new community asset. The Greensville site preserves the much valued walkability. New sidewalks and possible sidewalk extensions to Two's Falls make this school site much more appealing and accessible for the general community. Walkability is about 15% higher at this site than it is at Spencer Valley. With students staying for JK to 8 at Greensville, transportation efficiencies and savings could be realized. Greensville school site already has a fully paid for playground, a school sign, professionally done, and a student garden. A JK to 8 school at Spencer Valley would require the community to fundraise for a new playground as the ministry does not fund these amenities. Renovating Spencer Valley, should it come to that, requires unfunded FDK classrooms, about $700,000, classroom additions, ministry benchmark upgrades, a new playground, and it is less walkable. If location, location, location is a guiding principle for you as it is for me, then Greensville is simply a better location. Melgrove School is well located to serve the northern and eastern, eastern portions of the ward. The bus rides to Melgrove are already long enough for our youngest students. We need not put our primary students on the bus any longer under the cloak of consolidation. Melgrove School has the lowest FCI renewal costs of the five schools for years one to five and six to ten and has the lowest expenditures on school operations. This is really quite a feat for a hundred year old school. Millgrove qualifies for enhanced top up funding to 100 percent therefore is not a drain on our resources. The students have excellent EQAO scores as do most of our rural schools. The Millgrove community is well served with its seamless daycare arrangements already in place and at no cost to the board. The parents love this arrangement and it works well for our students and their families. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Millgrove still has a projected 75% and over utilization and could accommodate out of catchment students but potentially on a waiting list. Parent daycare choices need to be highly regarded and respected. Millgrove's total renewal costs and ministry benchmark upgrades with two new, small, two new small school partnerships are still less expensive over a 10 year period than the staff recommendations, depending on the ministry funding. So those are my comments about part two, and then I have summary comments after if people have questions. Thank you, Trustee Turkstor. So comments on part B or part two? <laughs> Trustee Hicks. Again, um, this proposal leans very heavily on the city. So my question would be, um, what would be the process with board and city officials to working through the agreement uh, with the library uh, and everything that Trustee Turkster has uh, mentioned? 
and in particularly the timelines. Uh, would the timelines interfere with the closing of June 2016? And in point in time, have our board officials and city officials started negotiations on these items? Thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, certainly if the board passed this motion, board staff would work very diligently to fulfill it, but we certainly could not speak for the city or city staff regarding any process that they would expect of us to follow. Uh, we certainly work together well now. We do have processes in place, but I couldn't speak for them. Thank you, Trustee Hicks. The reason I mentioned this, and again, I don't want to go back to back history because this whole process has leaned very heavily on cooperation with the city and the board as far as the political base is concerned. But having gone through the process with the North High School, it dragged on the process, and I'm afraid and I'm supporting this, by the way, because Trustee Turkster did a wonderful job in explaining the rationale, outstanding job. But just this trustee, just to let you know, I would have a concern that once the process has started, I hope the officials get back to us on a regular basis so that we can monitor that timeline of June 2016. Thank you, through the Thank you. Trustee Peddle. Thank you. I too will be uh, supporting this. Just uh, one question and one little correction. And I can we add an S to Greensville, please? I think we're missing that just for the formal record. And I think in three, we're meeting Ministry of Education again. So my question um, is to staff through you, Mr. Chair, on the point about capital requirements. Um, it lists very specifically the things that need to be done. It's included as part of this package. So my question is, do these capital requirements go into the queue for all the ARC dollars that this board has been setting aside over the last number of years? Is it going into the queue? Or are these must-dos as a part of the closure that's going to bump previous ARC closures that were less specific because we were learning and we didn't know to put them in, but the intent was the same? So I want to understand how we're treating these specific motions versus the ones that were previously done and we have a a lot of schools already in that queue thank you officer del bianco sure. through you mr chair we have uh, allocated renewal funds 20 percent of our capital budget just to address specific upgrades to arc related projects um, the projects specific to this one that would be addressed uh, immediately would be the gymnasium and fdk classrooms uh, as we go through that work if we can handle whatever um, additional electrical upgrades or HVAC upgrades, they would be part of that scope of that project. We anticipate that over the first five years, or over the next five years, um, Spencer Valley uh, would have approximately $2 million worth of renewal work conducted at that school to, to bring it up to speed and to address all the short-term renewal needs at that facility. Thank you, Trustee Peddle. Okay, so that was very specific to Spencer Valley, but wasn't specifically answering my question, which was, what does this do to the other schools in the queue? Does this one jump the queue because it's specific in the motion, or does it go into the queue along with all the other ones? That's my question. I want to know how we're, is it being prioritized as a group versus, oh, this motion's specific, so it now goes to the top and everyone else is waiting. Thank you, officer. Through you, Mr. Chair this would be prioritized as something that needs to get done as a result of these accommodation reviews. It would not jump anybody. Okay. So that was my concern raised at the last board meeting when we were on the fly adding a million and a half to a closure arc. Not that I didn't understand the intent or did I, I agreed with where it's going. What I don't agree with is that we're now trumping closure decisions that we made two years ago and they're waiting, and they're waiting. So unless I've misunderstood, that really concerns me. Thank you, I, I think that the previous comment didn't quite say that, so if I could go back to the Officer Del Bianco to explain Sir. his previous comment again. Through you, Mr. Chair, I apologize for any confusion. All of the work that we have already approved in previous ARCs is on schedule to be completed whether it's the addition at George R. Allen, whether it's the work at Dalewood, whether it's the work at Dundas Valley, and the two new schools. 
What we are proposing this evening will not take away from those. We've already allocated funds to address the renewal needs at these specific ARC-related schools. So, so what I'm hearing from Trustee Peddle, this is on the list in order when it comes to ARC decisions and renovations. That's the question from Trustee Peddle. So there's been money or renovations that have been requested through ARCs. Does this jump a previous ARC or is this in line with the other ARCs? Is that the, your question, Trustee Peddle? So I'll, I'll get specific. Sherwood was part of an ARC two years ago and we still don't know where the money's coming from. We have not got a plan. There is nothing specific. We weren't wise enough to be specific. So, you know, I have about four months left in my term now of board meetings, and I'd like to know that we've got that solidified. So I'm always uncomfortable that we've got new motions, new closures, and money and specific things to be done, and we're on the fly adding money to budgets, and we still haven't calm the communities where we've done secondary closures and those schools are in need. Mine is Sherwood, but others have them too. So I need to hear that this is a general fund that we're gonna treat all of our communities and all of our schools fairly from, or I will not be able to support this part. Thank you. Mr. Director? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'll start, and if the officer needs to finish. The secondary revitalization strategy that includes every single secondary school, including Sherwood, because remember, we have made commitments to ensure that all 13 remaining secondary schools are great schools. That report is going to finance at its next meeting, as I understand it, and then it'll be to the board in June with all of the proposed spending that staff is recommending, so trustees will be able to make uh, appropriate motions at that time. Thank you, Trustee Peddle. Thank you. Further speakers, Trustee Orban. Not being opposed to the notion that's being presented, but liking clarification, there are other elementary arts coming up. And will there be money if there are changes happening? Because what I hear through the officer is, anything you trustees do, we will support. Now, I have to get that clarification. Is that what's happening? So um, for me, that's so significant in view of the pain that was just brought up about Sherwood requiring 31 million yet to complete. So don't get, I, I don't want to feel upset, but it bothers me how a community, what happened in my ward, and now we're going to help out another ward that's fine, but then what about the other arcs coming up? All I want to know, that if there are changes and there is support, are we going to have money left for that? Because what I hear today is don't worry about it. You trustees make the moves and we'll give it to you. But that is, we're not sure about city fathers coming in on this, or are we? Thank you. Mr. Director? Through Mr. Chair, I've asked the officer to very briefly explain how business cases after any ARC decisions are created. And he, I've asked him to do that in a very brief fashion so that it, it would cover, it, it's a template of thinking that covers the whole process going forward and looking backward. Through you. Thank you. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, with regards to the ARCs that are in front of us today, every single ARC has a built-in funding strategy primarily driven by uh, proceeds of disposition from the sale of the property from within those individual accommodation reviews. Our first point of contact would be business cases to the Ministry of Education outlining our strategy. And business cases, as everyone is aware of, is strengthened by um, the variables that go in there, whether it be community partnerships, whether it be multiple consolidations. It's proving to the ministry that we've consolidated, we've eliminated surplus people places, we've eliminated surplus um, long-term renewal needs, and whatnot. So first and foremost, it's a business case to the ministry um, for full funding for the projects. Barring that, we have built in um, proceeds of disposition from the sale of properties as our fallback resource, which would be augmented by uh, renewal, need, uh, renewal funding that we get on an annual basis. Thank you very much. Trustee Orban. Well, I, I appreciate the 
cooperation of staff to uh, really look at community needs. And that is fine. I don't have any problems with that. But I do have problems of making exceptions to the rule. Now, if you say to me this evening, what happens tonight here with this particular motion is guaranteed, I'll accept it. But you're not saying that. What you're saying is, well, we're going to have disposition of property sites, et cetera, et cetera. And when we got the 31 million for the South Arc, what did you do with it? You're building, you are helping out more labs and so forth. You didn't look at the possibility. Through the chair, please. Through the chair, that if that happened, that was for building, not improving a certain uh, uh, labs through all the secondary schools. So just to clarify. All I want, the question is, are we going to be fair to all our arts? And I would like to know that because it's important for parents and students in my community, as well as it is for my colleagues' community, which I, I don't mind. That isn't my point. My point is equality, equity. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Orban. Next on the list, we do have Trustee Brennan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to return to the motion that's before us. And I'd like to uh, be respectful to the, uh, the community of Greensville and uh, West Flamborough in terms of making, having discussion and making decisions uh, that are before us tonight. Uh, with that regard, Mr. Chair, I, I am supportive of um, keeping Mill Grove School open. I believe we heard that very strongly from the community. And I think we heard uh, some um, rationale that made enormous amount of sense um, that this is a school that uh, currently can continue to be a feeder school uh, to wherever the new school is. So with that in mind, I'm su uh, strongly supporting uh, Mill Grove School remaining open. I, <laughs> I'm also very excited about um, very creative thinking uh, around uh, Greenville, sorry, I'm going to add the S, Greensville uh, school site. And, and the synergy of the community and geographical assets that are already there. Um, being a recovering librarian, I'm always happy when we can put public libraries and, and schools and community meeting rooms together. I do share um, some concern, as Trustee Hicks has indicated, um, because not only will this need uh, staff cooperation between the uh, board and the uh, city, it will require political support uh, um, from the councillors as well. Having heard the strong support from um, two councillors in West Flamborough, and totally knowing that Councillor Pasuda, uh, with his tractor alone, could do the heavy lifting <laughs> of any political work that has to be done here. Um, <laughs> uh, with that, somewhat cautious proviso, uh, I am extremely supportive uh, of this creative solution of bringing community assets to a beautiful geographical place uh, with a lot of amenities for the community. I think it's, um, it is beyond brilliant, so I will be uh, supporting it. Thank you, Trustee Brennan. We have Trustee Bishop followed by Trustee Mahalland. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't mean to say a great deal because I've already expressed my support for both, both concepts and, and for where this is going. And I certainly uh, um, see that, that, that this will be the solutions that are being s suggested here have a wonderful potential for the community. But I, my, my, only, my only question is, 
that um, we the four zero. Oh, I don't think that is a zero. Anyway, four um, in the last paragraph has has the capital requirements at Spencer Valley um, laid out in terms of of what would happen if if this becomes a a, a, um, a, a, a K to eight school. We we turn it into a K to eight school, um, and what what are the requirements there? And um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, my my only concern is that we, uh, as we go through this process, all schools which we are converting to a K to eight, or or are looking to improve, um, as we add in feeder schools, that we we apply a common equitable f uh, formula to them, so that that so that all have reasonable gyms, uh, all have reasonable accommodation for a K to eight population. And um, so I'm very happy to support the, 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 these suggestions here, but I want to be sure that we are going to be doing this in an equitable fashion across all K-8 schools. Thank you. Trustee Mahon. Mr. Chair, I, I just want to ask a question to the manager. You were talking about uh, concerns about the financing and how much was going to be available uh, three months ago. Ask manager Dalbeck give us the amount that we could accumulate to get back into repairs, renovation. Officer? Three, Mr. Chair. Um, Trustee Mulholland is referring to a report that came in front of the board in October or November, I believe, which identified all of our long term renewal costs, both short and, uh, and long term. Also, in that, one of the line items in that report was the total proceeds of disposition that we estimate should the board fulfill its mandate um, and complete the schedule of ARCs as presented. Um, that proposed, or the estimated proceeds of disposition are in excess of $150 million that we would then use to address the renewal needs at the remaining facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, don't, I do not have any further speakers on the list other than the summary from Trustee Turkstra. So I'll go back to Trustee Turkstra for a five minute wrap up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So I think everyone needs to keep in mind that we have two councillors and the MPP who are very, very supportive of pursuing partnerships. And they have both assured me that they will make every attempt to speak with their colleagues uh, about the, the, I would say, the um, robustness of pursuing partnerships, how it's a community asset building endeavor, how it helps the school and the school board and the city work together uh, in favor of communities and of course the taxpayer. So my summary comments really are that the recommendations I'm having you consider this evening satisfy the factors of the value to the student, the value to the community, the value to the school board, and the value to the local economy. It's time for stability in our rural schools. The status quo of $20 million of renewal costs was not an option for the ARC members or the staff. The options put forward by the ARC, staff, and myself today have all been discussed and considered. Many delegates, public meeting attendees, and emails alluded to the options I have put forward today. I believe that having three rural schools in three rural communities will serve them well for years to come. Partnerships at two of the sites, one on city-owned and one on board-owned land, demonstrates fiscal responsibility and a commitment, a true commitment to community hubs. There, the further the school is from the community, the less opportunities there are for student extracurriculars, parent volunteers, and community use of schools. Let's not make our rural schools more remote than they need to be. I believe that the ARC and staff option of a 525 pupil place school assumes that the ministry would fund two new schools in one review area. I think that this lofty but admirable goal is not attainable if there are not partnerships. The partnerships described would only work on the sites in the motion due to their locations within the community. The average rural school size at the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board is 266 students for 11 schools. 
by approving two new 350 pupil place schools. This is a 32% increase in school size. This is more palatable, reasonable, and rural than the 97% increase should the board consider a 525 pupil place school. Two new 350 pupil place partnership schools is only slightly more costly than one urban 650 pupil place school. Smaller schools don't need as much space as the larger schools and four to six acres is plenty of space for students and their activities. Partnership sites are the future and offer enhanced programming options for students and wider community use and enjoyment. Let's talk utilization and the long-term facilities master plan guiding principles as this is how we got here in the first place. Let's keep in mind that the objective is to meet some, not all of the goals. The overall utilization for the review area with these recommendations is over 90%, therefore meeting our goals for capacity and utilization. Two of the three schools will be JK to grade eight. For transportation, walkability is maintained and improved. Destination schools go from five to three, therefore transportation efficiencies are expected. Strategic placement of community schools translates into enhanced program offerings at the partnership sites. For all of these reasons already explained and cited, as well as the letter that I attached for your perusal from Councillor Robert Pasuda supporting both, of, both part one and part two, as well as Councillor Partridge and Minister McMeekin. I am asking for your, for your support to pursue these partnerships in good faith and stabilize our rural communities. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Turkstra. As the final speaker, we are going to go to the vote. The motion is on the pink paper. It was amended with a part six for the part one. So all those in favor to the motion as amended. That is Trustee Turkstra, Glauser, Hicks, Orban, Brennan, White, Bishop, Johnstone, Student Trustees Van Agnum, Susick, and Trustees Simmons and Petal. Thank you. And those opposed? Trustee Maholland. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Dan is just setting up for the next item, number four on the agenda. So we'll just take a two minute break as he sets up the presentation. Uh, we'll commence very shortly. Thank you.
agenda for the special standing committee meeting, we are on item number four, which is trustee arc questions. So as usual, Dan will go through the presentation of all the previous questions. If you have any questions for clarification, please hold those until the end of the presentation. Uh, and then following that, we will take new questions that trustees may have on any of the four arcs. So I'll turn it over to Officer Del Bianco. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, as always, the presentation this evening, along with all the handouts in front of trustees, will be posted on the board website, um, as well as any embedded links and other documentation um, for everyone to see. Uh, so this evening, it's broken up into two points. It's clarifications from questions that were addressed on May 12th. And very quickly, what are the legacy costs for schools from, for a JK-8 school? Legacy costs for a JK-8 school. What are the standards and expectations for elementary schools to be properly equipped? So, the outstanding renewal needs, um, specifically in reference to Central Mountain, the totals are there. These are renewal needs that we anticipate we will have to get done over the course of the next 10 years. So one way or another, if, as long as the school stays open, we anticipate um, that this is the total amount broken up by school in front of you. Um, the second part of that is, uh, what are the standards and expectations for an elementary school? So your first handout, uh, handout entitled handout number one, is a template for a 454 or 450 pupil place school. So I know we get this question a lot, and I think it's important to see exactly how the ministry defines the spaces. So I'll just very quickly go over this, just so we understand. 450. Four people place school would include four kindergarten classrooms, 11 regular classrooms, an art room, a science room, three special education areas, um, resource rooms, gymnasium, and you can see the size there at 6,000 square feet, change rooms, a library at 1,800 square feet, as well as a general purpose room. Same size as a regular classroom, however, depending on what we would like to put in there, a sink or whatnot, it can be a multi-purpose room. So when we discuss standards and what we're looking at doing, not only at new builds, but how we're looking at um, retrofitting existing buildings as they come through the accommodation review process, we, we use the ministry guidelines to help us. And this is a clean example for everyone to reference as we move through this, both in size and quantity of room, size, quantity, and type of room. Can we use a model for renovation that was used in the past for future schools? For example, Franklin Road as a model and a guide for JK-8 renovations. So we did a bit of homework on this one. And Franklin Road um, became a JK-8 school in September 2003. Prior to that, it was a K-5 school. And the renovations that took place, which roughly, uh, rough estimates are about a million dollars, um, included that list of, uh, of items that were required, some directly uh, tied into um, making the school K-5 to uh, to K-8, to that's mill work and whatnot, renovated gymnasium. Other ones, when we're in there and if we're keeping the school, we're looking at mechanical upgrades, we're looking at electrical upgrades and plumbing upgrades. So that's one of our real life models. Uh, specific questions to East Hamilton. What is the estimated uh, property of disposition for Rocks Park in Woodward. Now I put a big caveat here because there's a bit of a swing in this. These are general estimates that were provided to um, the, the ARC members. It's about $2 million per site. Which of the remaining schools in East Hamilton under scenario two, which is a scenario that we uh, were sent out to the uh, trustees a number of weeks ago, um, lack air tampering? and what is the cost to add air tempering to these schools. So just air tempering is a, another way of looking at air conditioning as opposed to having a chiller unit. Air tempering is actually bringing in fresh, clean, cool air from the outside and using that as a way to um, cool the school. So Parkdale, Rosedale, and Viscount have tempered air or air conditioning in the approved areas. And in this case, it's the office, library, computer labs, and staff room. Window units are not classified as actual air conditioning from a facility's perspective. Um, uh, WH Ballard, Temper Air, was installed in 2004 to, as part of that renovation. Hillcrest, the school, has air conditioning. Um, when we're asked how much is it going to cost to put in tempered air, uh, what I will say is that it's really site-specific. Um, that's my general generalization, but uh, just recently at Shadok, um, it's between five and $600,000 to put it in a building that's about 50,000 square feet. 
Um, and again, as we go into each of the buildings, and if this is what we're going to do, it's going to vary depending on the, the work, the size, number of stories, and whatnot. What is the condition of the gym floors and the remaining schools in East Hamilton? Do any of the gym floors require painting? So all of the gym floors have been identified. You can see the year in which we believe that the work requires uh, to get done. Uh, so Parkdale, the floors in the next five to 10 years at a cost of, the cost is a very generalized cost. We've, we've uh, of course, it'll vary from school to school when we actually tender it. But you can see the ones that are required within the first five years and those that are required in years five to 10, as well as the painting of the lines in, on, the, on the gym floors. Um, it is, a, and I guess there's the, the disclaimer at the bottom there that these are estimates and that we would have to visit them um, on a case by case basis. Can staff please provide a review of the east? So it's a boundary map that you have as number two. The boundaries, excuse me, have just been cleaned up to reflect uh, the projections that were handed out. Please break down and describe the urgent and high needs. Or renewal needs at Ballard, Hillcrest, Parkdale, Rosedale, by count. Does the ministry fund any portion of these renewal costs? So the thick package everybody has in their uh, agenda includes all the renewal needs, their priority, and the estimated cost. Uh, and this is all derived from what we used to refer to as RECAP. I think that's the familiar name that we all use, but the ministry funding model. So they're just estimates, and as we go through it, um, of course, we would tender the costs, and these are just to help us in uh, as we budget moving forward. Um, the ministry provides us with our annual renewal funding to, as I like to say, manage these outstanding renewal needs as opposed to address all of them, because as we know, we have almost, we have in excess of $600 million in, in capital renewal needs, so uh, the 10 that we receive on an annual basis is more to manage than it is to completely uh, eliminate. And the link is there, it's provided there to uh, the information. It was posted um, for all ARCs. So are FTK and accessibility related renovations necessary in, in ARC motions? Uh, are these items that staff will do outside of the ARC? So both FTK and accessibility, we, I'll break it down into two components. We have a five year rolling accessibility plan. It's a ministry requirement that we submit on behalf of the board. We adhere to that accessibility plan, understanding that as a ministry requirement, at least once in a five-year period, you need to update it. And our first update will come at the conclusion of these uh, elementary arcs. Um, so we do it in a number of ways. We have a five-year plan that we that we work on. Um, if we're doing extensive renovations in a building, and it's and then they're required, it's easier to go in and do them as part of the renovation as opposed to waiting five years for them to pop up. And of course, um, accessibility is addressed uh, under cer special circumstances. So we can plan all we like, we can look forward all we like, but you, you never know when um, someone with accessibility needs will enter our system. So while we do plan, we also hold a contingency to address any special issues that may arise from year to year. And finally, FDK needs at the remaining schools, that's part of the FDK rollout and funding rollout. So I guess to answer the question, we have a plan to address both. We don't necessarily need to address them as part of board motions with regards to ARCs, um, because I think we, we, these are factored both into funding allocations, FDK funding allocations, and our own internal accessibility plan. Uh, with regards to Central Mountain, what is the rationale for Queensdale becoming a K-8 school? Well, there's a number of uh, issues here. Uh, it's uh, reducing the transition for students, we follow the K-8 model, which is one of our guiding principles in the long-term facilities master plan. And as we reviewed all the boundaries um, under our revised staff recommendation, the K-8 model allowed us to better utilize the facility um, and keep it in our system that way. Is there room for Queensdale students to still attend George, or, um, GL Armstrong for seven and eight as they do present? Would there be room to, for grades six, seven, and eight from Queensdale? So there you have Queensdale, what it would look like as a K-5 to school with a capacity of 279. And you would see the revised numbers for GL Armstrong um, with a capacity of 633, including the six sevens and eights from Queensdale. A K-8 school of five to 600 students creates two to three classes per grade. Uh, in the revised staff recommendation, what is the average number of students per grade and the anticipated number of split grades for each school in the revised staff recommendation? 
um, for Central Mountain. The schools are identified there. The average number of students per grade, which is really just a multiplication exercise. The estimated number of split grades and the number of split grades in 2013. With regards to all accommodation reviews, in terms of the ARC process, at what point will the process be examined and possibly the ARC policy be revised? Um, if we use our secondary school accommodation reviews as an example, um, we conducted, um, I'd like to say, a significant survey post accommodation review once all the decisions have been made, which included trustees, which included staff, which included all, all of the ARC members, and we asked them a series of questions regarding length of the process, what they liked, what they didn't like. My expectation is that we do the exact same thing this time around. Uh, we have a very large sample size, so it's, it's great to learn from the process that we undertook, and uh, then we take a look at the policy um, once we have that feedback. Can we have a list of schools who receive top-up funding? So Ridgemount is the only school in the ARC to not receive top-up funding. That's probably the easier way to answer that question. Are there any schools that are recommended to stay open that exceed their operating revenue? So the final spreadsheet you have in your hands, and I'll quickly go through this because it's an interesting spreadsheet. Um, all of the schools are identified along the left-hand side. Should they all be running at 100% utilization, so it's a completely full, Enrollment is exactly equal to their uh, capacity, you could see what they would receive in funding. So if we use Cardinal Heights, for example, if the school is operating at 100%, it would receive approximately $286,000 in funding. The total projected funding, which is based on enrollment, suggests that it's actually going to receive $271,000. Uh, the difference of $14,000. If we look at the operational cost for that facility, which is the fourth or fifth column over to the right, to run that facility, heat, light, and general maintenance of that facility, it's 266,000. So the variance is 2%. So the projected funding, the two columns here, we're looking at total projected funding for 2014, 2015 at 271, and the total operational costs associated with that school at 266. And you can see as we go through this, the variance can be as low as 2%, can be as high as 28% uh, or 34% in that case. 87, I guess, would be the highest one, Parkdale. But it's an interesting bit of information, uh, and I know it's something that we've discussed a lot. What we receive in funding, including the top up, what we actually pay out in operational costs, and where that variance is. And that concludes our questions for this evening. Thank you. So are we going to trustees? Uh, are there any questions for clarification on the presentation? I'll go to trustee Hicks. We'll do all the arcs at once, you know, as they're going to only be on two arcs. So trustee Hicks. On the first slide, uh, we've asked this question before, and that the gymnasium area and stage is 6,000. Can you give me the size of the stage, which would leave me the size of the gym floor? Sorry, I, I'm sorry, Trustee Hicks, can you please repeat the question? I just want to make sure I, I have it straight. 6,000 square feet is the gymnasium area and the stage, right? Correct. Can we eliminate the size of the stage and could you give me the size of the gym floor that would leave us with the size of the gym floor? You're three, Mr. Chair, you're looking at over 5,000 square feet. And would that be equivalent to say the gymnasium at Kathy Weaver? What I'm trying to do is measure like 5,000 square feet. That's a lot of square feet. And I would imagine that, uh, uh, as an example, Kathy Weaver does not have, to my knowledge, and I could be corrected on this, does not have a stage equivalent on that gym, or does it? I think it's, I think it's standalone. If, if I'm not. But anyhow, so 5,000 square feet would be the area that the gym floor would be. Thank you. Do the chair. Thank you. Further questions of clarification? Seeing none, new questions pertain to any of the four ARCs or general questions about ARCs. And you can submit uh, any questions at any time by email through Heather.
seeing none. Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate that. So we're looking now uh, back to the agenda that completes the special standing committee agenda. So if I could find my agenda, I believe I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Trustee Glauser, seconder. Trustee Hicks, all those in favor? Thank you, and we'll resume shortly with our regular board meeting.
to the uh, regular board meeting of Monday, May 26, 2014. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, in light of the fact that we had a bit of a um, meeting lineup tonight, and I, I know you all want to sing again, but um, we will not do O Canada again since we did it earlier tonight, and I think, you know, that was such a good version, I, I can't possibly expect us to do better than that. Uh, so I will move to uh, approval of the agenda as you see it. A motion from uh, Trustee Hicks, seconder uh, Trustee Glauser. Thank you very much. Any commentary on the agenda and approval? All those in favor? Uh, not quite sure what we have. We have a we have a unanimous for those in the room. Uh, Trustee Mo. Oh. Um, and Trustee um, Johnstone is not going to be able to join us, so she has sent her regrets, and Trustee Mahalan is out of the room. Thank you. So the motion passes. Any declaration of conflict of interest uh, before you in terms of material uh, facing us? Seeing none, uh, I'm happy to receive a motion to confirm the minutes of April the 28th, 2014, and May the 12th, 2014. Do I have said motion? Trustee White, do I have a seconder? Trustee Orban, any commentary? All in favor for the confirmation, thank you very much. You'll see in your package item five, communication from our good friend, Carol Ann Sloat. Some of you will know that she is the person who keeps stealing superintendents from us. <laughs> And she's the one, every time we have a trustee conference, I'm always after her to stop stealing our superintendents. Um, but you will see before you uh, a concern uh, regarding trustee uh, representation based on population change in the area. It is uh, uh, Carol Ann, as chair of Grand Erie, is uh, sending a letter to um, support Durham District School Board's earlier letter, as you may remember. I'd be, I'd be happy to receive a motion to receive and file, Trustee Bishop, uh, seconded by Trustee Glauser. All those in favor? Thank you, and that's uh, unanimous for those in the room, and Trustee Mulholland is just returning now. Uh, we'll then go to the section of the board meeting that um, is dedicated to all the hard work that the policy committee members do, and the chair of the policy committee do does, as he's so well known to say. So here we go to the chair of uh, policy, and that is Mr. Todd White. Thank you for that grand introduction. <laughs> I'm happy to bring forward the policy committee report from May 14th. Uh, the committee met. Uh, there are four action items that are attached in the appendices for your attention. Uh, followed by uh, what's not attached, but an information update on the transportation policy. So starting with A, uh, the committee is recommending the approval of the attendance, uh, employee attendance support policy. Uh, this is uh, mainly operational policy, but trustees felt that we should keep it in a policy format as it speaks to um, attendance uh, supports for our employee groups. Yes, exactly. So. That is captured in what we see is the scoping report in A. So sorry, just to clarify, it's not approval of the policy itself, it's the scoping report and the items that will generate the policy. Uh, B, we have the finance and administration pillar policy, and that is simply a uh, reworking of the policy. There is no uh, content changes other than some small updates and reformatting to meet our new policy format. Uh, the, so the committee was recommending that for approval. We also have the C, the program policy that is being recommended to be approved. That did go for consultation. Uh, com committee, uh, or the committee received the feedback and made the appropriate amendments and now approved that for, uh, for um, 
approval. And lastly, D, the boundary, boundary review policy and directive. Uh, this one went out for consultation. We did bring it to, I believe, the board meeting last month. It was referred back to the policy committee with uh, small suggested changes for the purpose statement, as well as, I believe, the intended outcomes. Um, and those changes were made, and they're back in front of you for uh, your review, and the recommendation is for approval. And lastly, as an information item, the committee did discuss uh, the transportation policy, and did approve it for consultation, so it will be out at uh, some point through June, uh, ending somewhere near the end of September. So we thought that June was a fantastic consulting month, and uh, we wanted to give the most opportunity possible to the public and anyone else to provide feedback. So it will span June, the summer, and well into September. So Madam Chair, that is the policy report from May 14th, and I'm happy to move it. Do I have a seconder for the uh, report? Trustee Bishop? Again, just uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, to remind the uh, trustees that uh, policy committee is coming forward with matters from their committee meeting. Uh, this is an opportunity for the trustees to uh, weigh in, if you will, on any items that they would like to see changed or the uh, chair, of course, assumes that you would, uh, the chair of the committee, of course, assumes everything's uh, perfect and ideal. Uh, but uh, you may have different thoughts about that, and this is a good opportunity for us uh, to discuss it and uh, as a group uh, to see if we in fact are meeting um, various policies and various pieces of the policy process to your approvals. So uh, with that uh, proviso, any comment on the report itself? Yes, uh, Trustee Orban? My, my uh, comment is a general, a general comment, Madam Chair. And what it is, is that I would hope that somewhere down the line, there would be an opportunity for the various chairs of the committee to maybe consult with staff. I don't mean the board staff, but our teaching staff. They are the foundation of what goes on and how our kids learn. And they have ideas about their teaching or what they would like to incorporate. Could be. Sorry. Uh, yes. I, to Trustee Orban. No, I, I, I was distracted. Sorry. Okay. So it's a general comment, and what I'm asking that maybe there should be consideration for staff. Some of the teachers that I speak to. They're very knowledgeable, they do research, and maybe somewhere down the line, we could even have them sit on certain committees, maybe at OCK or whatever. And I'm also thinking of enlarging those committees with membership from the community. But let's, uh, so if we I, could. I know, I know that that's not what is being asked here this evening, and my humble apologies with respect what I'm saying generally, we, we look at these policies and I don't think we really think outside the box. Let me just uh, check Thank that you. observation though with the chair of the committee. Um, Mr. White, um, how broadly, and I look to the executive superintendent as well, how broadly does some of our consulting go uh, in terms of our staff uh, composition? Thank you. So just, just in general, when a, a policy is approved for consultation, it does go to dozens and dozens of stakeholders, including staff, employee groups, bargaining units, um, and everyone else within the organization, as well as many, many groups external to the organization. So everyone is contacted. It's mainly done by email format, unless the committee specifically requests that it go to a particular group. Um, there's often a portion of the meeting after a policy is approved for consultation that we ask ourselves if there are any specific groups that should weigh in on a particular policy and uh, we will add or delete groups as we feel are appropriate. Um, all of that information is posted online as per the uh, agenda for the committee so you can see the feedback um, as well as the stakeholders that are being proposed uh, for consultation whether it's before or afterwards so all of that information is publicly available. 
Uh, anyone else uh, with regards to item on the report? Yes, Trustee Hicks. Comment through the chair. The, at the last meeting, I made reference to governance and the motion I would bring at the appropriate time, not tonight. And I think some trustees had a difficult time trying to zero in on what I was trying to say. This is the best example. What we received tonight has not gone to the standing committee. And that has not been a past practice. What normally happens before governance, and before we get some changes, everything went through the standing committee, so that's where we met it, and that's where we discussed it. But in this case here, it comes directly to the board and the board discusses it, and the board makes changes. And the boundary review is a prime example when we sent it back. If, it, if these committees would go through a standing committee before the board, I think that you would shorten the process. So I just mentioned that, and I, I appreciate the understanding. The other night I made that comment. I wasn't quite sure people realized what I was saying and what committees I meant. Thank you. Thank you for that. This has been our practice for about a year. Uh, so, um, and I, I realize in the totality of, of the world since the cooling of the earth, uh, it is extremely recent. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else for the report? Not, uh, not seeing or hearing any. Um, all in favor of the approving the report. And that is unanimous for everyone in the room. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Trustee White. Uh, we now have, uh, looking for a resolution to go uh, into a private session. Thank you. Uh, do I have a seconder? Uh, Trustee Glauser, thank you very much. All in favor? Is, is everyone voted in? Yes, that's uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Again, uh, to our uh, guests and uh, members of the media, I, uh, this is a uh, point in time that uh, we need to have uh, some matters uh, for private discussion uh, related to the Education Act.
Madam Chair, I'm happy to uh, bring forward the report from the meeting date of April, April 29th. One moment. I'd say we have a technical problem, but we have more of a choreography problem. Please bear with us. Thank you. Yes, Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to bring the Special Standing Committee report from April 29th. It's 9A in the packages. Uh, we received delegations. Uh, we heard those and we received them. Um, there are items 1, 2, and 3. That's a combination of the delegations, communications, as well as trustee our questions. So, Madam Chair, I'm happy to move the report. Do I have a seconder for that? Do I have a seconder for that? Thank you, uh, Trustee Simmons. Any commentary? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item, Madam Chair, on 9B is the Special Standing Committee report from May 5th. This was the East Hamilton accommodation review. We received the delegations and the corresponding communication. Happy to move the report. Thank you, uh, Trustee White. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Glauser, any commentary? Seeing none, all those in favor? Unanimous, thank you very much. Trustee White. 9C is the Special Standing Committee report from May 6, which uh, the topic was the Central Mountain Accommodation Review. Uh, we received the delegations, communications, followed by our, trust, our trustee our questions. I'm happy to move this report. Thank you. thank you, Trustee White. Do I have a seconder? Trustee Hex? Thank you. Any commentary? Seeing none, all those in favor? Trustee Orban, I know you're picking I something up. Never. Okay, thank you very much. That's <laughs> unanimous. Uh, Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to bring a report from the regular standing committee from May 12th. Uh, there are a number of items within this agenda. Um, we'll just go down the list quickly. Uh, there's the West Glanbrook Accommodation Review Number 3, and then there was the recommendations um, as such that are that follow under that item um, regarding the closure of uh, and uh, proposed renovations to the existing school. And item, <coughs> item number four is the finance committee reports uh, from April 9th, 23rd, and 30th. Um, and those were received by the committee and approved. Um, also in that was the enrollment projections. Um, and uh, further to that, there were the Special Education Funding Finance Committee terms of reference, and once again, all of that was received for information. Item number five was the Human Resources Committee report. Uh, that was information on A and B, uh, the committee mandate, as well as Bill 122. Item number six, it was from the Programs Committee, and that was the election of the chair, as well as the Parent and Community Engagement Report that was brought forward, um, and that was information. Um, well, the election of the chair was an action item. And number seven was the governance report from May 5th, uh, which recommended the approval of that agenda, which included a process for trustee appointment and the update um, on that, uh, trustee orientation, as well as board special committees and their terms of reference. Item number eight, the naming of parts of Coots Paradise Elementary School. There was an action item um, there to rename the library as well as the gymnasium. Number nine is the student trustees uh, for next year for 2014-2015 and lastly uh, number 10 was the private session when we moved into that session and then we did trustee our questions following madam chair i'm happy to move the report do i have a seconder for that trustee Simmons. yes trustee Peddle. 
I'd like us to separate uh, subsections two and three of number three, please. And you want, sorry, Trustee Petal, do you want them separate from each other? Or, sorry, can I understand what you're asking to just pull out three completely? No, not three. <laughs> I've misunderstood that. I'm, I asked for sections, subsections two and three of number three. Oh, okay. And you want that pulled out? Yes, please. Thank you. Pull it on separately, each of them. Okay, and so you want, sorry, three, two separately, and then three, three separately, is that correct? correct? Okay. That's correct. So, um, two, three, two, rather, regarding three, Two, the word, the proposed renovations to Mount Hope as outlined in the following table, and there are a number of items in that table with the estimated cost to 1.5 million. All those in favor? Trustee Turkstra, Glauser, Hicks, Orban, Mulholland, White, Brennan, Bishop, Student Trustees Van Egdom, Suzik, Trustee Simmons, those opposed? Trustee Petal. The um, motion st stands as uh, per report. Um, item three, just below the proposed renovations, also include the playground and gym expansion and parking lot. Um, all those in favor? Trustee Simmons, student trustee Suzik, Van Egdom, trustee Bishop, Brennan, White, Mulholland, Orban, Hicks, Glauser, and Turkstra. All those opposed? Trustee Petal. Thank you. Any other items in that report? Trustee Mulholland? <laughs> Thank you. So for, to the rest of the report, uh, moved again by uh, Trustee White and seconded by Trustee Simmons. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Then we move to a special standing committee of May 20th, uh, going to uh, Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. This was the special standing committee for May 20th last week regarding the budget. Uh, just to note, there was a conflict of interest from Trustee Mulholland. Um, in addition to that, we heard uh, the reports uh, from the superintendent of business regarding uh, the finance, uh, the budget for 2014-15. We did move to private session, and then when we came out, um, we did uh, have an action item that was moved and passed for approval at this body, and trustees will find that on 9E at the bottom. And within that motion, there are um, three separate items um, for approvals of the 2014-15 budget. Madam Chair, I'm happy to move the report. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Trustee Mahal. Thank you for that. So recording a conflict with uh, Trustee Maholland on this matter. Do I have a seconder to the motion? Trustee Bishop? Yes, Trustee uh, Turkstra? Now, about 10 minutes before, I was saying you're all lagging behind with your hand raising, and now you're all ahead of me. My apologies, that means I'm lagging behind, I apologize. So, it, Trustee Bishop, is that for the vote or for a comment? No, it's for comments. Yes, thank you, see, it, Trustee Hicks, is that for vote or comment? Okay, then I'll go to Trustee Hicks because his hand was actually up before yours. Trustee Hicks. Just the location of the meeting, wasn't that meeting held in Stony Creek? Yes, uh, that is true. Thank you. Um, to uh, Officer of Trustees Services, just to the, the report uh, should indicate that it was at uh, the Stony Creek City uh, Hall. Thank you for that, uh, Trustee Hicks, for catching that. Uh, Trustee Bishop? Well, Madam Chairman, I, I would like also to, to indicate that I believe it, that the recommendation was carried unanimously. That's not noted. The final recommendation, open session resumed at 8.23. On the motion, the committee recommends that the 
report of the Finance Committee be approved and it's not been um, Yes, thank you for that. And it would note right there, uh, we've had this discussion before, that the conflict of interest prevents um, Mah uh, Trustee Mahalan from voting there. So it's um, carried be, unanimously be, for those who can vote. That's right. It just, yes. just doesn't. So, um, Madam Chairman, if I could just remind people this is the budget that we're passing. Um, and those of us who worked weekly on this budget are quite proud of our budget uh, and the work that we've done. And we're also very proud uh, and pleased with uh, the work of staff. Um, in fact, Madam Chairman, we're all pretty self-satisfied. Um, <laughs> um, the the, the, the uh, Finance Committee, as I, uh, I thanked them um, previously, so I hope you won't mind if I don't repeat myself about that. We are Although allowed to I'm be redundant on that. I'm still as grateful as I was, Madam Chairman, uh, um, uh, when, when I originally presented this. And um, you will also remember that we had some budget challenges because although the revenue appears to have increased, this is largely a 1% increase to elementary teachers to make up for, for the fact that they did not receive the same amount as the secondary teachers in the last round of negotiations. And trustees also had to find, um, uh, uh, there was also um, an increase in full day kindergarten, which also looks as though the budget has increased because this is the final year coming up of full day kindergarten. And trustees have always to find the best use of our resources available. And uh, I'd like to remind people that in the Education Act, we are charged with student achievement and finding the best ways in which to uh, um, uh, um, promote student achievement. And our own vision of this board is in all students reaching their potential. So our budget, as we were reminded by the superintendent, needs to reflect our values and vision and our priorities, and our priorities, of course, we shared with the community and we did have support for them through the consultation process that we went undertook. So we, we, we do think student achievement and what happens in the classroom is the paramount importance to the work we do. And particularly in this community, this is a way out of poverty if children are successful in school and uh, uh, achieve according to their potential, then we also create a society which is, but has the potential for being much more um, successful than otherwise. And our long-term decisions made by this board of trustees are allowing us to make savings to balance the budget without making cl cuts to classroom support. The new Ed Center, which opens in July, means that our decision to have only one education center has consolidated all four administrative buildings into one, which allows, means all our departments are together for the first time. This means there can be staff reductions where and we resulting in about 770,000 in savings. And there will, of course, be future savings from the energy efficient building, which will be used to finance that new education center. And our decisions not to continue to fund empty spaces in schools has resulted in this year in about $2 million in savings, both in energy costs and in administrative costs to schools, because of three schools will close, and that means we no longer need principals, caretakers, and clerical staff for them. The future further savings will be are generated in operations for future boards to redirect for classroom instruction. So on behalf of the Finance Committee, um, uh, we, we are approving a budget tonight which is fiscally prudent that allows us to continue to put our priorities in the right place, which is in classroom instruction. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to uh, be sure that um, all the wonderful commentary you've made is in fact absolutely so on solid ground, we will now have a vote. Um, with for the committee uh, report from uh, moved by Trustee White, seconded by Trustee Bishop. Uh, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. I I do uh, I think. Thank you. Did I miss? I Except for those not able to vote. Thank you. I I. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, I. I, it is one of the most important things that we do as Board of Trustees, which is to, in fact, create a budget. 
Um, I want to thank uh, the chair of the Finance Committee for due diligence, uh, um, both in um, describing the budget to the public here tonight, as she has done in the past. And I want to thank the members of the committee very uh, truthfully, because so many questions that um, you asked and the directions that you um, made the staff go in terms of getting answers, I think was demonstrated again your thoroughness and your due diligence. So uh, to the committee and to the chair, uh, Judith Bishop, I want to thank you all again very much. Um, we are then at one more uh, for Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's my pleasure to present the report of the private session held just a couple of moments ago. The committee considered a private report from Standing Committee of May 26, and it included approval of the Finance Committee reports from April 2nd, 9th, 23rd, 30th, and May 14th in respect uh, to updates on the 2014-15 budget process, including updates on staffing. Also, it included an approval of the Human Resources Report from April 3rd and 14th, which up included updates on personnel matters. I'm happy to move the report. Thank you. Uh, Trustee White, do we have a seconder? Uh, Trustee Hicks? I think I'm feeling like an auctioneer and now just reading people's faces. Um, and any other? Commentary to the <laughs> mover and seconder? All in favor then? That is unanimous, thank you very much. We uh, happily go to, I'm not sure if it's the very last student trustees report or the penultimate report. Yes, sad indeed. Um, that uh, our student trustees, uh, Philip and Su uh, Susick and uh, Carly Van Agdam, are going to fly out of the nest into wonderful places next year. Congratulations to both of you for your academic excellence and uh, your future universities, and lucky them that you're both going in September. So, if you could give our rep your report, thank you. Shedding a tear over here. <laughs> Not really. Anyways, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It'll be messed. I can assure you that much. Yes, the mood's lighter. Okay. Anyways, moving forward, on the Osta Aco front, Osta Aco elected its, elected rather its executives for the 2014-2015 school year, and they'll take lead coming August 1st, which is when the transition takes place for next year's student trustees. I think it would be noteworthy to mention that a Mr. Trevor Sucrouch from the Peel District School Board is actually the president of Osta Eco. I thought that'd be worthy to mention just because I know a few trustees in our board have been in contact with him in the past. Fabulous person, no doubt he'll lead the organization to new heights. Moving forward, uh, seeing that Osta Eco is of course a provincial stakeholder in education, I look to the west uh, to actually BC uh, to talk about how BC Education Chat took place last night over social networking, specifically via Twitter. Uh, it involved current student trustees, trustees, sorry, educators and other educational stakeholders, and it was regarding student voice across the province of BC. Of course, this was a hot topic, that, uh, sorry, or rather a hot topic that was spread, sorry, apparently I can't read this evening. A hot topic was the spread of student trustees across the nation. Do we send a letter to the, um, is it Queens that you're going to? <laughs> now I'm going to start crying, thank you. Um, I apologize. So yes, again, um, the only reason I mentioned this, even though it was a BC matter, just simply was because student trustees started here in Ontario and it's wonderful to see the position flourishing and spreading across the nation. Take that, Queens. <laughs> and that's all for the Las Vegas report. So I'll be doing the report of local activities. So um, as we've been talking about previously, we recently held our Sway conference, which was on Friday, May 16th, and it went really, really well. We were both really pleased with uh, how it went. It was really exciting, and um, Dr. Molloy also came to give a speech for closing, which was really exciting. Um, I just love to, love to give a huge thanks to all the senators, board staff, St. Joseph staff, attendees, and attendees, as well as uh, Superintendent Prendergast, Aaron Freeburn, Michelle Bates, and Michael Murray, who um, were all 
huge aids to Philip and I uh, as we were planning the conference and just going through um, facilitating with senators and trying to figure out all those important key details of hosting a conference. Uh, over 100 students came and uh, that was really exciting for us. Really huge turnout and they were all very excited to be there and uh, I'm sure they learned a lot. We got to step in on a lot of the different workshops that the senators and uh, staff held and it was really exciting to see senators in action just promoting uh, mental wellness and wellness in general. Um, we had, I'm just gonna highlight some of the activities of the day. So we had Zumba. Um, we also had a workshop on laughter yoga, which is really exciting. I've never heard of it before, but it was lots of fun. We had some open space discussions, uh, art collage, collaboration, nature walks, and we also had a snack provided by the Schism. Uh, some of the students from, I think it was Glendale Schism, came to provide hummus and <coughs> mountain, sorry, mountains Schism. Uh, who came to provide some hummus and uh, freshly cut vegetables. So that was really awesome too. Um, so yeah, it was just a, a great collaboration with St. Joseph's that we were able, able to partake in and it was really exciting for both of us and hopefully it'll continue in the future, but that's up to the next student trustees, so we'll see. Thank you for your leadership in, uh, in putting that conference together and to um, Superintendent Prendergast and, and staff who, uh, who also assisted you in doing it. And uh, I think it's just such a leadership opportunity that the two of you really um, commanded the entire conference and put it together. It's uh, simply wonderful. Thank you both very much. And I know that at OSTA uh, Gala, um, my apologies for not being able to make it this year, but we had past, present, and future student trustees uh, we had uh, Lexi Ewing and Susan Tian uh, from uh, previous years. Uh, we had uh, Philip and Carly there, and we also had our brand new Hannah and uh, Rakshan. So fabulous to see so many from present, past, and future. Thank you. We don't have our delega a delegate from OPSPA tonight, so let's go to uh, the director's report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I would just offer that this is the time of year when we get to engage in wonderful celebrations. And I, I want to bring to the board's attention, though I think you may already be aware, that the, at the Yes I Can Awards this year, our own Superintendent Corcoran was honored. And I think that we uh, would love to give her a round of applause. For all the work she In the spirit of honoring uh, wonderful contributions, we've also celebrated, as uh, many of the trustees were able to attend, our volunteers at the Profiling, profiling Volunteer Excellence Celebration uh, last week at Michelangelo's. On the student front, we had hundreds and hundreds of our students involved in the Run for Change, which is con connected to and supported by the Start to Finish organization, which provides so much to our students through the Backpack Program. Again, a number of the uh, Superintendents were there, I was there, I actually did the whole, uh, I walked, I didn't run. Uh, Trustee Hicks was there and he, he gave us a round of applause as we were starting down uh, the path. So it was a great uh, celebration. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that in the, in the name of social justice, Free the Children was at Sir Winston Churchill with about 400 of our students who are engaged in raising funds for educational projects in Africa, as well as to raise awareness for needs that are here in our local city. So again, a wonderful opportunity to see our students so engaged, so connected. The energy was amazing that day. And so the other piece along the same lines was the social justice fair, which happened at Sir Johnny McDonald also this month. Again, seeing our students focused on others focused on making a difference is so amazing and I simply wanted to mention that tonight as we celebrate so many tonight during our profiling excellence earlier today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Director, uh, there's no formal uh, chair's report, but I do uh, again want to thank uh, the trustees individually for um, the heavy lifting they are doing on the, the committees that they're on. Uh, finance uh, is quite heavy, as we know, at this time of year. Uh, policy committee, uh, it's just a long list of activities. Uh, and I just want to thank all uh, the chairs of human resources and the chair of governance for all the tremendous work uh, that is going on in, at the committee level. And with the board of trustees, I want to thank you all as a group 
in terms of tackling some um, um, dis discussions that uh, have come to you uh, from the communities um, where they have done some consideration and thought, thoughtful reflection. Uh, we've had lots of delegations, lots of uh, uh, correspondence and communication. I know the process isn't finished, but I want to thank you all as a group for really um, taking responsibility of these important decisions and, and, uh, and coming armed with good thoughts. So thank you all very much. And I now would be very pleased uh, to receive a motion to adjourn. Oh, Trustee Hicks. Coming meetings, I'm positive that Wednesday's meeting of finance starts at 12.30 and not 12. So well, let me double check that. Thank that you for that, change, Mr. Please. Hicks. Um, Trustee Bishop or uh, Superintendent Zucker, is it 12.30? Thank you. Does anybody else see anything else on our upcoming uh, Meetings. Thank you for that. Not seeing that. Uh, happy to have an, a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Trustee Simmons. Seconded by Trustee White. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. No, you don't.